This is Module 2, Radiation and Radiation Safety. Module 2B, Radiation Safety and CT Dose Reduction. The origins of the data on biological risk of radiation essentially come from one source, which is basically the result of either uh, nuclear accidents or atomic or hydrogen bomb uh, detonations. Currently, there are no clear data on cumulative risk of diagnostic radiation for cancers since all data are theoretical and reference back to specific nuclear events. There are two important issues, however, in radiation protection, which applies to both patients and providers. The most important is justification of dose, which is basically performing a study that is appropriate for the indication. Next most important is to optimize the dose by the principle of ALARA. ALARA is defined as as low as reasonably achievable. The assumption based on what is called the linear non-threshold LNT hypothesis is that any radiation no matter how low carries with it a certain level of risk proportional to dose. The emphasis on ALARA was initially raised in the 1970s when an increased incidence of solid tumors was noted in atomic bomb survivors. Now in those particular situations, these instances were associated with very high and acute radiation doses in excess of 100 millisieverts. However, nobody could say whether similar results would occur with smaller acute doses. The International Commission on Radiation Protection states that as any exposure may involve some degree of risk, they recommend that all unnecessary exposures be kept as low as is reasonably achievable. Thus, the ALARA principle has no limit but is a philosophy of dose reduction strategies. It is generally accepted that higher doses of radiation are linked to both short-term and long-term effects on the human body. However, there is no clear agreement on the health risk associated with diagnostic imaging using X-ray. Studies done on airline pilots and healthcare workers who are amongst the greatest exposed individuals in the workplace have shown no clear evidence for increased cancer risk. However, because of the relatively long timelines between the exposure and development of cancer, it was at least 12 years in survivors of the Hiroshima bomb blasts, certain concerns have then been raised, especially in younger individuals who would have longer lifespans after exposure and would then have an increased lifetime attributable risk, or LAR. Concerns are higher in women due to the in to the issues related to the radiosensitivity of breast tissue and its potential contribution to the development of breast cancers. This is an example of a result of a paper that was published in JAMA in 2007 looking at the lifetime attributable risk, LAR, for a particular exposure either to a man or a woman by a retrospective cardiac CT examination. The higher dose in the woman compared to the man is related to the amount of breast tissue estimated in women compared to that in men. These values then are shown on the panel in the right. However, let's translate these into uh, realistic numbers. At age 40, a 0.099% translates to one excess cancer in roughly 1,010 exposures. At age 80, a 0.044% translates to one excess cancer in 2,272 exposures. There are various ways to reduce radiation, especially to the breast. Several manufacturers produce breast shielding devices, which according to their estimates can reduce radiation to the breast by 25 to 70 percent. Shown here are examples of a CTA performed with a breast shield. You can see the clear 
artifacts in the panel on the lower left. However, on the eventual CT angiogram shown in the right, it is a very clear and crisp image. Radiation exposure then should be put in perspective. Radiation exposure again uh, by CT is related to X-ray energy, tube current, exposure or scan time, slice thickness, coverage area divided by pitch, and whether you use retrospective versus prospective gating. Shown on the graph are the radiation source and on the y-axis the radiation dose estimated to the patient. For air travel, it is somewhat less than one millisiever per each uh, situation. Mammography produces roughly 0.75 millisieverts of radiation using a two-view mammogram. Background radiation living in the USA is defined as about 3.65 millisieverts per year, higher if you live in the higher elevations such as Denver and a little bit less in other portions of the earth. Multi-detective coronary calcium scanning using a prospective tool produces a roughly one to two millisieverts of radiation. A diagnostic cardiac catheterization is listed somewhere between five to 10 millisieverts of radiation. A barium enema, a very commonly used screening examination for colon cancer, produces roughly eight to 10 millisieverts of radiation. A multi-detector CT examination angiogram done using a 16 slice scanner would produce between 10 to 12 uh, millisieverts depending upon uh, the method employed. A stress MIBI examination, a commonly applied stress nuclear examination produces about 10 millisieverts of radiation each time this is performed. A multi-detector 64 slice CT angiogram using retrospective gating produces radiation doses between 12 and 15 millisieverts and can be higher depending upon the protocol employed. SPECT 201 thallium imaging produces amongst the highest radiation in diagnostic cardiology, ranging anywhere between 12 to 15 and as high in some estimates as 30 millisieverts. Rubidium PET for cardiac imaging produces a higher radiation than thallium, roughly on the order of 18 to 20 millisieverts. One can employ a variety of techniques, which we'll discuss subsequently, to do prospective gating with multi-detector CT and 64 slice to get the total radiation dose down to that of a diagnostic cath, and in many situations, much, much less. This is an example of radiation risk, the bottom line of cancers for medical imaging. For flying 1,000 miles, it's 0.01 millisieverts. A mammogram can be up to 1.4 millisieverts. Annual natural exposure is averaged at 3 millisieverts. A coronary CTA could be as high as 15 millisieverts, producing these types of risk. And a dual isotope stress uh, imaging study could be as high as 25 millisieverts. This should be casted and compared against cardiovascular disease, which the mortality per million is greatly uh, higher than all of these estimates of mortality from radiation exposure, on the order of 2% per year compared to 0.075% per year for coronary CTA. There are, however, very important dose reduction methods that we need to employ. The highest radiation is uh, received when we do retrospective gating. That is, we've acquired the images throughout an entire series of cardiac cycles, and then we retrospectively go back and try to pick out uh, the phases that are important. This allows us to quantify LV function and is very beneficial when there is tachycardia because frequently a diastasis uh, 
set of images reconstructed may be insufficient and we need to return to end systolic phases for a better resolution. This, however, produces the highest radiation. If we do prospective spiral or axial step and shoot, this can produce the lowest radiation because we have decided to do the radiation during a preset phase of the cardiac cycle. This does not allow quantification of LV function. The step and shoot axial imaging does provide less radiation than performing a spiral prospective examination with a slightly longer breath hold. However, the, either of these protocols requires a very stable and slow heart rate. And if there are PVCs or PACs during the examination, then there are difficulties in providing diagnostic imaging. Importantly, reducing the KV probably provides you with one of the greatest ways to reduce radiation. Remember the radiation dose is proportional to the KVP squared. So going from 120 to 100 MA can reduce the radiation dose by as much as 30 to perhaps as high as 40 percent. Here's an over overview of the same situation. If we decide to do ECG dose modulation, that is alternate the MA at particular phases of the cardiac cycle. Now note what this do does is allows us to do retrospective imaging, but certain images certain, during certain phases of the cardiac cycle are not as clear. We can still quantify LV function, but emphasize the best images during the phases of the cardiac cycle in which we anticipate will have the least motion artifacts. You can reduce the radiation dose using a retrospective examination by as much as 37 percent. However, ECG dose modulation is not acceptable when the patient has tachycardia because the images that are dose modulated during systole and end systole may in fact be the best images for reducing motion artifacts. By reducing the tube current, again lowering the KV from example from 120 to 100, we can reduce the radiation dose by as much as 40 percent. This can decrease the signal to noise ratio but also is not acceptable when the patient is obese. So therefore, we want to emphasize and take as many pictures as we can with higher radiation doses in patients who are slightly heavier. Again, here's an example of how to reduce the concerns about uh, cancer risk in individuals. Shown here is the example from the JAM article that I show before using retrospective cardiac CTA. By performing retrospective, by reducing the KV from 120 to 100, plus doing 40% dose reduction uh, with this technique, we can see a significant reduction in the total radiation and a subsequent significant reduction in the lifetime attributable risk. Other techniques are being developed by the manufacturers. One of them is automatic exposure control. This has been used for years in x-ray and is now being applied to cardiac CT. Essentially, it adjusts the tube current according to the patient's size and changes in attenuation along the z-axis as well as possibly during each rotation. One can then result in about a 25% overall radiation exposure reduction using automatic exposure control. This is then a summary of methods that we can use to reduce radiation dose to the patient. First of all, you can limit the coverage area. During a uh, imaging study of the native coronary arteries, it is unnecessary to scan much higher than the mid aortic arch, uh, and this then can reduce the radiation dose to the patient. One, of course, can lower the milliamperes or use automatic exposure control techniques. You can lower the KV as discussed in previous slides. You can also use beta blockers, even though beta blockers certainly don't reduce radiation.
The use of beta blockers and thus slowing the heart rate down indirectly allows us to use a variety of other techniques such as ECG dose modulation to further reduce the radiation dose to the patient. Thus dose modulation is another excellent way of reducing radiation exposure. Retrospective gating is another very important manner. If you don't need to have information on left ventricular function and you have a slow, stable heart rate, then retrospective gating makes the most sense in line with the principles of ALARA. Prospective gating also can be done with step and shoot rather than in a spiral mode using specific scanners. You can also do combinations and these all then allow lower and lower dose radiation 